to the Paul Gard Chess University. In this lesson, I'll discuss a very important and fun topic, to check or not to check. For beginner players, it's a big temptation oftentimes to give a check when they have that option. I always tell my students to give a check is not an accomplishment in itself. With that being said, of course, it's important to know that the advantage of giving a check is that it greatly limits the opportunities, the moves of your opponent, because you always, at all times, need to respond to a check. Your king can never ever remain in a check, so you cannot just continue on with your own attacking plans. So in this lesson, I'll give you some examples. Five, when you should not be giving a check, and another five, when indeed, check is a good choice. So hopefully, by the end of this lesson, you'll get a better idea when to check and when not to check. Let's start with our first example in this simple queen endgame. What are white's choices here? At the moment, we have a total material balance, each side having a queen and four pawns. Beginner players are often tempted to give checks such as queen e8 or queen h6 in such situations. However, that would walk by a much better opportunity. For example, if white would play queen to h6, check, black would simply move his king out of the check, and then white would have no follow-up to the attack. Typically, one piece in itself, such as the queen on h6 here, is not enough to create a successful attack. White would need at least one other piece to aid the queen, as we've already seen in previous lessons when we were talking about different attacks or mating patterns. Giving a check on e8 instead looks a bit better because this not only attacks the black king, but also at the same time attacks black's pawn. However, luckily for black, black by moving out of the check, moving the king to g7, not only got out of the check successfully, but also protected the pawn on f7 at the same time. And again, while white didn't really lose anything, it missed an opportunity to win something. And if we go back to the starting position, we realize that instead white had an opportunity to capture a black piece for free. Can you find which piece I'm referring to? Yes, indeed. It is the pawn on a7. And now white would have excellent winning chances having a free passed pawn on the A file that can be a potential queen. Let's move on to our next example. Here we go. In this position it is white's turn and the white knight is being attacked. The question is where should the white knight go? Again, there is a temptation to give a check to the black king. Of course, the check from e5, while it may look attractive since it attacks the black king and pawn at the same time, it's not hard to notice that in reality it would be a blunder because it would put the knight onto an attacked square by black and the bishop could capture the white knight. But how about the other check from h4? Well, that doesn't look as bad as moving the knight to e5, but nevertheless, it's quite a bad move. Typically, knights are not belonging on the edge of the board. And this is a perfect illustration why not, because oftentimes the knight will get trapped there. Just like here, black will move out of the check 
to g5, attacking the white knight on h4. And then the white knight has no safe square to go to, and neither can the knight be protected. So the white knight is trapped. Black will capture it on the following move. But what should white play instead? If neither of those knight chucks are good, what is the best move for white? Well, the best move for white is to try to go after the black pawns. But which one? Should white go after the very pawn that's attacking the knight with knight d2? Well, it's an okay move. It's certainly much better than either knight chuck, but not the best move because now black could simply protect the pawn and life goes on. The ideal move away with the knight is to move to d4 because it attacks a pawn that's far away from the black king and is also on an opposite color square than black's bishop. Therefore, the bishop can come to no aid of the pawn, and as the king is so far away, neither can the king. Black's only option to avoid the loss of the pawn immediately is to push the pawn up to c5, when the knight would jump to c6 going after a second pawn, with knight c6, the only way to protect this pawn is to play bishop b6. And now, white has a well-placed check on e7, and wherever the king moves out of that check can be followed up by knight c8. This is a real dangerous situation for black right now, because if the bishop moves away, then black loses the pawn on a7 and clears the path for the a pawn that pawn will promote. And if the bishop does not move away, for example, the king is getting closer, then after knight takes b6, black cannot really capture the knight without the white pawn promoting. So this is what white should do and not give checks. Let's move on to the next example. where white has an extra pawn in the rook endgame. And in fact, white has a very tempting move, capturing a second move with rook takes e6 check on top of it. This would be one of those rare situations when a check can be answered with a check. That means that now the black king can move to either f five or even f7, either one, creating a discovery check to the white king and at the same time attacking white's rook. So what's happening is now white will need to move out of the check and then the black king will capture the white rook for free, leaving black with a significant material advantage. Of course, instead, white could choose many good moves Pretty much any other move is pretty good, leaving white with chances to win, having an extra pawn. Just white should not fall into the trap. Let's move on to our next example. And this is another endgame with rook and bishop and rook and bishop and each side having six pawns. Again, white has an opportunity to give a check, and at first it may seem like a tempting thing to do, but in reality it would be not the best choice. It's important to notice that the black bishop at the moment is targeting the pawn on b2. And indeed, the correct move would be to move away from that attack, and then the position would be about even. Instead, if white would give a check, the problem is that in addition to moving out of the check with the king, which typically is the first reaction of beginners, black has a much better choice. And I keep reminding you over and over that whenever you get a check, make sure you 
recognize all your options because moving your king out of the check is only one of the three possible options. You can possibly block the check or at times even capture the piece, the very piece that giving you a check. In this case, blocking the check is certainly Black's best option because it not only defends against the check but at the same time also attacks white bishop. And if now the white bishop moves away, then black would capture indeed the pawn, even though white may attempt to win the pawn back by attacking the bishop, and then when that bishop moves away, capturing the pawn. But the problem is that now black wins the pawn anyway by capturing the one on f2. And in fact, creating some very unpleasant threats of discovery on the following move to move the rook, for example, back to f7. A check wouldn't help because, again, the black king would not be forced to move out. But, in fact, black could give a counter check by blocking it with rook f8. And now, at the same time, the white king is under check, which means king needs to move in this case, and white loses the rook on b Let's move on to the next example. In this position, again, we have an endgame with balanced material where white can give several different checks. Let's start with a check by moving the rook to d6. Is this a good idea? Well, normally it could be a decent idea. The problem is it actually tactically loses material. The black king is able to move out of the check and creating a fork at the same time, which means it attacks two of white's pieces, namely the rook and the knight on f4. So therefore, this check helps black. White has a couple of other checks at his disposal, which are certainly okay, although not the very best moves. For example, knight d5 or knight h5, they're playable, but again, they would miss the opportunity to gain some advantage in this position. It's very important to recognize the opponent's pieces that are on unprotected squares. And those pieces are the black rook, on c8 and black spawns on b7 and h7. I'm not saying that in every single situation it is possible to take advantage of that. However, it's a red flag and you should be looking around see if you have an opportunity to create a double attack or a fork or a pin or a skewer in some situations. In this particular case, White's best option was to bring the rook to d7 to attack two black pawns at the same time and only one of them could run away at the same time. And now let's move on and talk about situations when indeed giving a check is a good idea. Let's see our first example in the series of those situations. This is a very typical situation when some pieces have been traded off, one side has already castled, while the other has not. If black would get the time to castle without loss of any material, for example, if it would be black's turn, the position would be completely equal and quite symmetrical at that. However, it is white's turn. And by giving a check, white can ac accomplish something very important, namely to strip black from the right of castling. And as we'll see, that will cause problems in various ways. While giving a rook check right away is certainly not a bad move, because black will be forced to move his king out of the check and therewith give up the right to castle, in fact, white has an even better move, an even better choice by checking the king with the queen. 
The reason why this is even better, because now if the black king moves out of the check, not only that black lost the right to castle, but black is also about to lose a pawn after the fork with queen b4 check that attacks not only black queen but pawn on b7 at the same time. If after queen a4 check, black chooses to play c6, not to lose the right to castle, and not trying not to give up a pawn, then already white indeed would play rook f to e1, and if king to f8, the same way win a pawn with queen b4. And finally, if after queen a4 check, black blocks the check with the queen, then again, rook f to e1 check. If the king goes to the f8 square, then again queen b4, the same way winning a pawn. And if the king tries to go to d8, then it's even worse because the black king and queen are on the same file, allowing a pin by rook a to d1. Let's see another situation when it's indeed in white's favor to give a check. In this position, again we have material balance, where the position would be close to equal if white would not have the opportunity to force the black king out from its safety zone. And remember this setup between the white bishop and queen. It's a very dangerous one, especially when black does not have a knight on f6 defending the h7 square. So here, white should force the black king out from its safety by check. King has only one move, and then queen h8 forcing the king to the middle of the board, which is certainly a very dangerous situation to be in for black. On one hand, white could be able to capture the pawn already on g7, but white can do even better, namely bringing another piece to the attack, the rook with rook e1 check. And now black is facing serious, serious trouble, because if the king moves to f6, Black would simply lose a rook, or if the knight blocks, and while the black rook now is attacking white's queen, after queen takes pawn, the black knight would simply find itself in a pin and would be lost. And if the king tries to walk to d7, the problem is the white bishop is ready to enter the action where the black king has no more escape, the black rook will be forced to step into the pin and black would lose further material. So again, what we learned in this example is that if we can expose the opponent's king to danger by giving some checks, we should certainly do it. Let's move to the next example. Here we go. In this position, again, it is white's turn, and white has the ability to chase the black king out from its safety net, where it is right now on g8. If it would be black's turn, black should certainly secure the 8th rank, so white couldn't continue the way they can when it's white's turn. So right now, white will play rook e8, chasing again the king out from the safe area being behind his pawns hiding on the 8th rank. And now, rook f8. It's a safe square as the white bishop protects it. And now, regardless where the black king goes, white has a winning attack. If the king goes to e6, which typically is the less desirable direction going towards the middle of the board because the king will be continually chased. With queen e2, if king d7, white checkmates immediately with queen e8. If the king goes to d5, the checkmate arrives 
from queen e4. If the king goes to f5, that is checkmate in three moves by check, and the second check, and a third, which is a checkmate. So, after rook e8, king f7, rook f8, what if the king goes to g6? It's certainly the more tempting way to go, at least being surrounded by his own pawns and bishop. The problem is trouble comes still after queen d3, king h6, and the queen getting real close to the black king, threatening with bishop d2 on the following move, putting black in serious danger again. Let's see the next example. In this position, White has sacrificed the pawn earlier to achieve this opportunity to strip Black from the right to castle. And again, in this case, it's a good idea to give a check because it forces Black to move with his king. As we know, when a king is being forced to move, that king lost the right to castle for the rest of the game. And now white would be able to follow up the attack with a few forceful moves, starting by attacking black's queen, and then chasing the black king further out to the wild, where the king can be attacked further. Queen h5, threatening to checkmate by rook takes pawn, g6, and then queen f3, and later capturing the pawn with a winning attack for white, because the black king is very exposed in the middle of the board. And here comes our final example. In this endgame, we have even material. But again, white can give a successful check to win a pawn. So again, we've seen in various examples that we usually accomplish something, whether exposing our opponent's king to danger or winning material could be two of the main reasons why we would want to give checks. In this case, the check on b7 is a correct one because it kind of, or through an x-ray, attacks the pawn on h7. And after the king moves to g8, white has two different ways to win the pawn on h7 or on f6. Either by checking on b8 and then followed by rook h8, when black could no longer protect the pawn on h7, or after rook b7, king g8, the other option is to check from g7, and when the king goes to the corner, trying to hang on to that pawn on h7, then playing rook to f7, threatening on one hand the pawn on f6, and on the other hand to checkmate with rook f8, back rank checkmate, when black's only move to defend against it is to move back to g8, and then again white on a pawn. So, the answer to, to check or not to check is, it depends on the exact situation. Hopefully, these 10 examples give you a better idea what to look for when you have a temptation to give a check. And at the same go, if your opponent gives you a check, it does not mean necessarily that he achieves something. In fact, at times, to give a check is a blunder or it is a move that lets go by an opportunity to win material or win the game. So don't be afraid of checks. However, always be aware of their existence. Thank you for listening. So long until next week. Mm -hmm.